Welcome to a webinar on, on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, and and BEATS, Bee Colony Collapse. Uh, I'm Karen Hansen Kuhn with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and uh, ITP and ARC 2020 and EU Coalition are organizing this webinar together. Over the last few years, there's been growing concern over the phenomenon of bee, bee colony collapse. There's also a growing body of evidence that neonicotinoids, a kind of systemic pesticide, uh, is a primary cause of that bee die-off. Today we'll be exploring some of the connections between neonicotinoids and bee die-off, what actions are being taken in the U.S. and the EU, and what the potential impacts could be of TTIP. Uh, we have some really great speakers today. Uh, first, we'll have Jennifer Sass. Jennifer is Senior Scientist in Health and Environment Program of the Natural Resources Defense Council. A U.S. NGO. Uh, she reviews U.S. government regulations of industrial chemicals and pesticides and assesses the data underlying those decisions. She has degrees in anatomy and cell biology as well as toxicology. She'll be followed by Jim Kleinschmidt from IETP. He's our Director of Climate and Energy Initiatives where he focuses on strengthening the link between rural policy and local decision making. Then we'll have Martin Germina from, from the Pesticide Action Network in Europe. Uh, he is, Martin is a veterinarian and has been keeping bees since he was 14 and working on the issue of neonicotinoids for the past six years, the last two with Pam. And then finally on TTIP, uh, Robert Peterson, who is the Food and Policy Coordinator at ARC 2020, a platform of 150 food and farming organizations. Uh, his background is in public health, nutrition, and food policy. So I'd like to say just a couple of words about how the webinar works. Uh, at any point during the webinar, you can go to the screen, the little drop-down box on the right side of your screen and type questions. We'll be taking questions all through the webinar, and then after the presentations, uh, we'll have time to, to answer those questions. Also, after the webinar is over, we will be uh, sending everyone a link with the recording of the webinar, uh, which will also be posted on our website. So, let's go ahead and get started uh, with Jennifer Sass, who will give us an overview of the issue of the colony collapse and, uh, and what's being done so far in the U.S. Thank you very much. Um, Hopefully, people can see my screen now. Um, so, um, hi, welcome um, to the webinar, and thank you very much to the organizers. I'm really excited about all the speakers today. I'll be doing a few minutes on um, neonicotinoid pesticides, a little bit of the science and toxicity, and a little bit of the policy, and then the other speakers will be covering the policy in more detail. So, first of all, um, so neonicotinoids are used quite widely around the U.S. They're um, the fastest growing and most heavily used class of insecticides in the U.S. Um, and that's because they've been marketed <clears throat> as a reduced risk or safer replacement for the organophosphate pesticides. The organophosphate pesticides, as I'm sure most of you know, were highly toxic war-era um, chemicals. Um, <clears throat> that were both toxic to the insects that they were intended to target, as well as um, humans, uh, fish, wildlife, all sorts of other animals, and people were poisoned by organophosphates. So these um, chemicals, these neonics, or neonicotinoids, were considered a safer replacement. Unfortunately, they share the same or a similar mechanism of toxicity as the organophosphates, and they are also, like the organophosphates, highly acutely toxic to bees. So a high dose exposure, even for a short time, will kill bees. In a way that's not surprising, they're insecticides, so they, they target insects, they kill insects, and that makes bees very vulnerable to almost all insecticides, including these. The problem with the neonics that makes them peculiarly and uniquely, I think, risky is that they're also very long-lasting in the environment, more so than the organophosphates and other classes of pesticides, and they're systemic. They're designed to get into the plant. Um, and while that was considered to be safer 
because it meant that they didn't have to be um, sprayed over and there would be less worker poisonings. And also the, the companies originally promised that they wouldn't get out of the plant into soil or waterways. In fact, we know that all that's not true, that they, they do leave the plant. They do get into soil and waterways. And worse, they make the whole plant toxic, including the pollen and nectar that the bees are exposed to. Um, the, this is just a, a quick graphic, I'm not going to stay on this, showing how they get into all the different parts of the plant and how the bees can be exposed, um, both from the pollen and nectar of the plant. Um, other, wa other wildlife are exposed from contaminated water as runoff. Birds eat treated seeds and can be um, poisoned that way. And the dust from the treated seeds can contaminate all sorts of insects, including bees. Treated seeds are a particular problem. There's a lot of different kinds of treated seeds. Almost all the corn grown in the U.S. starts with a neonic treated seed. And um, um, as well, about half the soybean seeds in the U.S. come pre-treated with neonicotinoids. Other seeds that are pre-treated include wheat, dry beans, potatoes, and winter squashes. The problem with the pre-treated seeds is that you don't even have a pest problem yet and you've already used a pesticide. They, and they, it, then the plant is poisoned um, for insects. So it's, it's really a terrible approach to pesticides and it sets us backwards by using the pesticides um, even without a pest problem. Oh, I should mention there was um, some reports that came out, especially an excellent report by the Center for Food Safety called Heavy Costs that um, evaluated these seed treatments and showed that there was either little or no benefit in terms of crop, crop production. And um, I think that report was very, very influential in stimulating the EPA to do its own assessment. And the EPA recently concluded that there was also little or no overall benefit from soybean seed treated um, uses. The EPA unfortunately says that they won't look at other seed treatments um, such as corn would be nice. Um, but I think the general conclusion is that there's not much benefit to using them <clears throat> from the farmer's perspective. There's a lot of toxicity though, there's a lot of problems. And this was taken from a, a research paper by Dr. Christian Krupke, published in 2012. And what I found interesting about this paper was not only the important conclusions that Dr. Krupke made, but that um, it was posted on a website on integrated crop management under Iowa State University. So this is corn country, and even in corn country, the IPM, or integrated pest management folks, are raising concern about the use of these um, chemicals, and especially the seed treatments, because they're so toxic, and they make the plant so toxic, and they don't have much benefit for the crop. Home lawns and gardens can be contaminated. Um, those plants can also um, be contaminated. Um, and that's because the neonics are used in those ornamentals and landscaping plants. An excellent report by Friends of the Earth and um, Pesticide Research Institute, PRI, um, together showed that tested plants from um, landscape and ornamental um, plants and showed that uh, all, over half of these garden store plants had neonics in them already, and that's because they were treated so that when you bring the plant home, it will be resistant to pests. So unbeknownst to you, you may be actually poisoning bees in a garden that you may be planting specifically to attract pollinators. There, why are these um, toxic to bees, and how do we know? Well, there's been a number of different reviews, and I've um, provided some citations here, and I think all the citations to my whole talk are in the notes portion of the talk, so you can see that later. But overall, the conclusion of scientists is that the available scientific studies provide strong evidence that the levels of neonicotinoid chemicals routinely detected in pollen and nectar, which is somewhere around 10 part per billion, it can be as high as 100, and it can be as low as 1. Um, it's harmful for bees at these levels. The important thing is that it's not necessarily harmful as an acute toxicity treatment. It doesn't necessarily kill the bee on contact, but it, it um, 
causes harm to the bees that weakens them so that the colony has more trouble uh, either reproducing and replenishing itself or lasting through the winter. It seems that honeybees and bumblebees have a bit different effects and I think that has a lot to do with differences in how they live and how they colonize. Honeybees, which are the managed or commercial bees, they live in colonies that can be on average around 50,000 or higher, um, somewhere between 30, 40, 50, 60,000 bees in a colony, whereas bumblebees um, can be in colonies that are as small as 100 or even 10 bees or even ice, single or solitary bees. And so they can, in many ways, they, the bumblebees just can't withstand um, any bee death. Um, whereas the honeybees or colonized bees have some advantages in their high numbers and also they're being managed. So their, their beekeeper may be treating some of their diseases. It seems that in honeybees there's, they have immune suppression. Um, the neonics cause immune suppression so the bees are more vulnerable to pathogens. Um, there's neurotoxicity evidence. They have impaired foraging and homing ability. That means that they are much less able to go out and collect food and find their way home again. They, they do less food collection trips in a day and each trip takes longer and they're getting less um, pollen with each trip and they have more trouble overwintering. With bumblebees, there's been a number of studies that showed loss of queen bees and, and the queen is the only one to survive winter. The queen on her own has to start the new colony in spring. So if there's no queen, there's no colony. As well, there's evidence of reduced brood production. They're not producing as many babies and reduced foraging, um, not collecting as much food. Again, you have a small colony of bumblebees and if they don't have enough food, um, they'll die quickly. There's also a concern about how these pesticides interact with other pesticides um, to become even more toxic. And that's a concern because there's over 100 pesticides found in a bee colony. And as well, um, they impair the, the bees' ability to withstand pathogens. That includes varroa mites and nosema and other viruses. So they can make the bee weaker to those pathogens. There's also evidence that the neonics are toxic to other wildlife. There was a huge report um, by this task force on systemic pesticides. It came out earlier this year. Um, and they reviewed over 800 peer-reviewed papers over the past several years. And in particular, regarding neonics, they concluded that their environmentally relevant doses that you see in the fields over multiple seasons can harm the bees by impairing their smell, memory, breeding ability, and foraging and food collection ability. That some of them are much more toxic even than DDT, and that even the breakdown or metabolites may be more toxic. And importantly, they concluded that the traditional toxicity tests that are done to register a pesticide are not able to catch these long-term um, effects. But we know now that you know, these neonics may not kill bees instantly, but they're killing bees slowly. And that's just as deadly in the end to the bee. Um, and other wildlife as well. Um, and human risks. Um, there's been a number of different studies now um, suggesting that there may be risk to humans and that's likely because they act in a similar way as the organophosphates, impairing the, hum the human nervous system. There's been some studies here that have um, shown in rodents that high doses caused um, neurological problems including neurobehavioral impairment in the rodent pups that were born. And a study by Bayer showed that when it was given to a, a mother rat, when she had daily doses throughout pregnancy, that her babies were impaired and had low performance on a number of different neurobehavioral tests. Another study um, on people um, found that there was a link between um, different kinds of autism spectrum disorders and kids that were prenatally exposed because of home uses. And related to that, there's thousands of incidents of home use poisonings um, that were reported to the EPA by Bayer in regard to its products um, used for home, mostly lawn and garden products, as well as flea and tick products used on pets. A lot of these poisonings were children because children spend more time with their pets and uh, often sleep with their pets too. So the treated pets are playing on the lawn, caused a lot of poisonings. Um, 
the effects range from headaches, dizzia, nausea, and rashes to chemical burns and asthmas, wheezing, and muscle weakness. And these are people that um, reported going to the hospital. Jennifer, um, we'll need you to wrap up soon. Okay. It's also found in a lot of uh, foods that we eat and waterways um, as well, so we know it's getting in there. We're not regulating it very well at all, but the White House has issued a memorandum um, suggesting, um, asking the agencies to come together and come up with a plan, and the Department of Interior said that it will phase out neonics on federal wildlife refuge lands. Um, there's been some local bans in different places, Oregon, um, did a few, did one in Washington, Spokane, Washington, and Minnesota is considering one, which is a really big deal because of the ag use in that state. Congress has a few bills. They're probably not going anywhere, but today's election day, so I guess we'll see. Um, the European Union, other um, people will talk about, but good for them for issuing a moratorium. And um, Canada had a beekeeper class action suit, and I think that's it. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. That was really informative. Um, next, we'll have Jim Kleinschmidt uh, sharing some issues uh, for U.S. farmers on Neonix. Hi. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be relatively quick, and, and Jennifer's introduced some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. I'm really going to kind of dig a little bit into the connection to agriculture more directly um, and, and how the neonicotinoid C coatings are involved. Um, as was laid out, you know, most commodity crop seeds in the U.S. are coated with neonicotinoids today. Um, and, and as she also said, there is new research, a lot of research starting to show that there's little to no benefit to those seed coatings from a crop production perspective. Um, that being said, there still remains minimal choice for most U.S. farmers um, unless they're uh, looking at the non-GMO crops and markets, and obviously the organic markets. So, um, so uh, you saw one of these, um, I'll show it later, this one's more about the, the, the seed coating, the, the specific uh, neonicotinoid that's used on corn. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's extensive. This is the corn belt, and this is where it's mostly in use. Um, you've already saw the one with the uh, So, um, and that's with soybeans, wheat, and some of these other crops. But what you see is just the profuse use that we, are, we have now in the U.S., and it's gone up so dramatically. And it's tied directly to these seed coatings, obviously, as that's where the primary use is being seen. Um, but why? I think that's the question that everyone's starting to ask, is why is it there? Especially as, as, as Jennifer had pointed out, the, the report from Center for Food Safety and other researchers like uh, Dr. Kupke from Purdue have been seeing that they actually see no difference in, in many of the field trials they're conducting between treated and untreated corn seed um, from a perspective of uh, pest pressure and impacts in almost all cases. There are very specific cases where farmers do see some value, but that's um, from agronomists that we've talked with, that's less than 10% of the acres in most cases. Well, this is obviously going on over 90% of the corn acres. Um, similarly with soybeans, as Jennifer pointed out, the EPA just recently released a study themselves that, that states exactly that, that there's little to no benefit. Um, and so, um, so this is, I think, a question that's out there increasingly for farmers is why are we putting this material out there that has uh, such risk and such harm to the pollinators, which are such critical uh, components of our agriculture and food system and our ecology, why would we be putting something out there that, in fact, is actually providing low value? And I think this kind of explains it. Um, it's largely due to the concentration in our seed companies and, and in our seed industry and, and the tide uh, and, and the strong ties obviously between them and the chemical industry in the U.S. agriculture industry. So what farmers are mostly offered is seed from a, a local dealer, someone who's local, but it's seed primarily from one of these major companies. And, and from our uh, discussion with farmers, we're finding that most of them do not have a choice uh, with seed. They may have a choice on treated or untreated uh, altogether, but they aren't being given a choice of whether they want the neonicotinoids included along with fungicides and other things that, that they see of some value uh, from a seed coating perspective. So most of them are being presented with an all or nothing choice. And even then, it's generally all. Oh, um, they have to specifically request to have untreated seed, and that doesn't happen as often. Um, where do the choices exist? Well, there are some choices, and certainly within 
the non-GMO market that is increasingly out there. We see that from what remains of the independent seed dealers, and I'll go back, there are some. You'll see within the soybean, um, between safe seed and local producers, you're still talking about about 20% of the U.S. market in 2013. And the corn market still is 11% local, smaller than regional companies, not these large uh, five companies. And so those companies do provide some choices. And increasingly, they're, they're seeing the, the demand and the need for non-neonics for not big neonics on the seed. And so they offer custom coating treatments where they will offer farmers uh, affordable options to actually uh, get seed with maybe some other coating that they see a value, um, but not uh, the neonics. So uh, with that, that's the end of my presentation. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, I want to remind people that you can be typing questions into the chat function or the, the question box. Um, next we'll have Martin from Pesticide Action Network Europe telling us about the situation in Europe with, with new rules. Um, I'm very happy to present you the European Union situation. So when... Um, all right. Okay, um, so new nicotinoids were first used in the EU in Western France in the mid 90s and directly the first um, massive uh, honeybee colony losses were observed in this region and as uh, the, the surfaces of neonics use is increased in the EU there were more and more uh, problems with uh, honeybee colony management. Uh, it could either be uh, in, as um, acute colony losses in in spring during the the planting of of, um, of uh, some some flowers or corn, or also due due to um, overwintering problems. Um, scientific evidence have piled up during uh, the last years, especially since the beginning of year two thousand. Um, and in Europe, there is a big tradition of beekeeping, so um, very quickly media started talking about the problem. And uh, there is uh, thus a very high public awareness about that and a lot of concern of citizens. Um, in the EU, the pesticides are uh, dealt with by uh, regulation that is uh, uniform and uh, that has to be respected by all EU member states. Uh, it's Regulation 1107-2009. Uh, in this regulation, it is clearly mentioned that insecticides cannot be sprayed on bee attractive flowering crops, uh, that in, in pesticides cannot have harmful effects on non-target animals and on the environment. <coughs> Uh, that there is a need uh, for enough toxicity information before any approval of uh, pesticide and that uh, the European Commission is obliged to withdraw a substance approval uh, according to new scientific evidence on um, toxicity to honeybee. Um, but the problem is that this regulation um, was not adapted to systemic pesticides and actually uh, neonics were the first systemic insecticides that were approved in the EU when they were authorized so they could get uh, through um, uh, this regulation. Um, so during many years at EU level, um, you know, all the different potential causes of honeybee decline like um, uh, pathogens, um, the lack of biodiversity and also pesticides were um, stressed as possible uh, causes of bee decline. Um, and uh, the European Commission therefore didn't do anything. But some member states took action, like Italy for instance in 2008, they were the first ones to ban neonicotinoids uh, on seed coating of uh, corn. Uh, they, immediately, from one year to the other, there was no more honeybee colony losses. It was really impressive. And before the ban, the pesticide industry said that there were, would be a massive drop down in, uh, in corn production and that would increase the cost of milk, of meat, and so on. And after uh, the ban, uh, it, could be, it has been proven that there was no impact on corn yields at all. This was uh, very interesting. 
Uh, Slovenia also made a ban on, on maize and uh, sugar beet seed coating uh, because of massive colony losses during the sowing of uh, these plants. And uh, after the ban, the, the colony, honeybee colony die-offs stopped. France made a lot of restrictions as well, and also Germany. In 2012, uh, a bit surprisingly, two studies uh, uh, made things change, uh, one from Henriette Aale and another one on honeybees and another, another one from Whitehorn et al. on uh, bumblebees. The first one was uh, very interesting because it could show that uh, neonics uh, were um, um, hampering uh, honeybees' um, um, orientation sense. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, the dose that was used was 10 times the dose that could be uh, really found in, in crops. But still, as this, these two um, uh, studies were highly uh, covered by media, uh, the European Commission was kind of pushed and had, had no other option to move. The, 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 there were too many evidence uh, show, pointing, out, pointing at Munich as a, a cause of honeybee colony decline. And uh, thus the European Commission requested the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, which is uh, the European Commission's risk assessor for pesticide toxicity, to make a report. EFSA made a report and the conclusions were high risk of neonics and fipronil to honeybees, bumblebees and solitary bees. So in 2013, the European Commission um, discussed with member states to make a ban on be attractive crops uh, and not all member states were in favor of the ban uh, so in the end the European Commission had to force it it was yeah it was not democratic among uh, EU member states the European Commission ob obliged a ban on be attractive crops so contrary to what some people think, legally speaking, it is not a moratorium, it's a ban, it's permanent. Um, but what's written in the, in, the, in, the in the ban regulation is that there will be a review in 2015 of the ban. But in theory, the ban is permanent. Uh, so there is a ban on seed treatment of uh, bee attractive flowering crops. Uh, spraying with neonics remains authorized, but after flowering, never before flowering of um, bee attra attractive crops. Seed coating remains authorized um, for winter cereals and beets. And the ban is based on the risk posed by neonics to bees, on the lack of scientific information on chronic toxicity, sublethal toxicity, uh, toxicity to bumblebees, to solitary bees, and the toxicity due to dust during uh, sowing of the plants. Um, as I told you in 2015, there will be a review of the ban. Uh, it will be based on new evidence from independent science. This is good because there are quite, maybe once or twice a month, new independent studies uh, showing that neonics are toxic to bees or bumblebees at uh, field realistic uh, concentration. Uh, the ban will also be reviewed based on the data provided by the industry, so this we will have to, I think, uh, uh, be very careful on that. And EFSA will make uh, thus a new evaluation. Um, the, after the ban, Bayer and Syngenta, and also BASF, I forgot to mention it, sued the European Commission before the European Court of Justice against the ban. Uh, and a coalition of NGOs we are part of uh, has decided to intervene uh, in favor of the European Commission. So we enter the court case to support the Commission in, in this uh, ban. And also Pan-Europe um, decided after the ban to make a court case, um, not against the ban, but to extend it, because the EFSA opinion mentioned a lot of risk using seed coating, but not only on bee attractive crops, uh, because seed coating uh, um, leaves a lot of residues of neonicotinoids in soils, 
and a lot of wild pollinators nest in soils and may be intoxicated. And, but the European Commission did not take this into account in, uh, when they did the ban. And my last slide is on derogations, just to say that everything is not perfect in the EU. Um, there is a possibility for member states to make emergency authorizations of uh, a non-authorized substance. Um, so uh, neonics are not authorized anymore on, uh, for instance, uh, maize, uh, well, corn or canola. Uh, and um, but if a member state thinks it is uh, an emergency to use that to them, they can they can uh, make emergency authorizations. And five member states have been using the, the derogation possibility. Uh, despite there are alternatives, as I told you, when it was banned in Italy on, on corn, uh, nothing happened afterwards, but um, some member states are, are fiercely against the ban and make use of this uh, derogation possibility. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. Um, our final speaker will be Robert Peterson. Uh, from ARC 2020, and he'll be telling us more about the links to TTIP. I want to remind people once more, after this, we'll be going to questions. I have a few, uh, but do feel free to type in any questions in the chat box. Yes, um, good afternoon and good morning, and thanks for the introduction, introduction Karen. So what I'm going to try to do, and I'm going to try to do it fairly rapidly so we have time for questions, is to make, make the link between TTIP and neonicotinoids. And you'll see in my title is TTIP, Neonicotinoids, and Endocrine Disruptors. And the reason I put endocrine disruptors into this is because I think there are some parallel, parallels between what's been happening with TTIP and endocrine disruptors and what might happen with uh, legislation on neonicotinoids. So just a very quick introduction, I mean, just to let give the overview of what TTIP and what, what's at stake. Number one, transparency. Um, the negotiations take place in behind closed doors, so a lot of our information is based on leaked texts and negotiating documents, so we don't always have 100% perfect information. And I think in an issue like this that's so important for the public and public health and the environment that the, that the negotiators are really shooting themselves in the foot. They need to make this process open. And then the other big issue is regulatory coherence. Um, the, this trade, uh, trade agreement is largely about, um, because tariffs are relatively low or very low, um, so what this is really about is uh, developing regulatory coherence. And then the last major point is investor rights um, or the investor state dispute settlement, which basically allows uh, corporations to sue states for loss of profits if they, say, regulate. Okay, so that was kind of, but the, the whole chapter on regulatory coherence, I think this is what uh, what's really relevant in, in relationship to neonics. Um, and also endocrine disruptors. So what really uh, the TTIP is trying to do is iron out the differences between regulations and regulatory systems uh, in the US and the EU. And what it really works towards is having the least trade restricted policy. Um, and the way, the, the way they're thinking this is, is this would mean that if, if in the EU when they're working on a regulation or thinking about a regulation and the same for the United States, that they would have to give advance notice of the proposed reg regulation or executive orders. And, and also that this should all be based on cost benefit and trade impact assessments. We could also ask whether environmental impact assessments are in this. And I also just want to highlight that some of this um, regulatory coherence or work with regulatory coherence in TTIP falls outside of the, of the actual TTIP process as we've seen with the pilot project on endocrine disruptors, which is a pilot project between the US and EU to see how they can uh, harmonize the regulations and, and uh, way of identifying endocrine disruptors. So I, I think the important question is, is now how, how can this uh, 
relate to, to neonicotinoids. And, and I think one of the things we've seen is, is a big push by the industry. Um, I have to go back, that was a mistake. Um, we've seen a big push by the industry and, um, and one of the you know, citing crop life, life that the proposed neonicotinoid ban in the EU is, EU is an abuse of the precautionary principle. Now, the precautionary principle is what actually gives us the, the ability to, to deal with uh, scientific uncertainty. And I think we're seeing a lot of this uh, attack by, by the industries producing neonicotinoids and questioning the science um, that's used in these bans. And I have to go back one. I'm, I seem to be missing a slide. OK, but that's, that's OK. Um, so, so I think what we're seeing right currently is, is that TTIP might not be directly affecting uh, the way we legislate neonicotinoids, but it certainly could have an effect in, in the future. And what we've seen with, with the uh, legislation on endocrine disruptors is a lot of delays and postponing. And now currently there's a roadmap on endocrine disruptors, um, and this is actually defining the criteria for endocrine dis disruptors in the context of the implementation of the um, plant protection product regulation and biocidal product regulation. And what we're seeing with this is that it looks like they're actually introducing the U.S. model of, of risk assessment into this, into this uh, one of the options in the roadmap. So, so I think this is just an example of how TTIP and this move towards regulatory harmonization can actually influence how we're developing our, our legislation. Now this is, you know, we, we have a, a ban in, in the EU and I think as Martin said we're not perfect because there's a lot of different things with the, the derogation and implementing rules and I think we also have to think about what's going on in the states with introduction of uh, citywide bans and different bans at local level um, and how this can be affected by TTIP. Um, so th this is the slide that got mixed into it, but, but um, you know, actually there was an interview with the CEO of Syngenta and what he, said, what he was suggesting is they would like to annul the partial ban on neonicotinoids um, through the trade in, uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership. So I think some of the, the positions from the industry at least indicates that they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on these bans and that, that TTIP could actually be a vehicle or mechanism for doing that. So we don't have any clear indication um, on how TTIP will affect current legislation on neonics, but I think we can look at some of the delays and how, how it seems to be shaping the legislation on endocrine disruptors and some of the fears that we have on that, and that that could also be very true for regulation on uh, neonicotinoids. And one of the things I think that's important is, and, and this is what Martin mentioned, is these kind of derogated rules that, that are you know, emergency efforts by states and also through the commission's implementing rules and how these things are actually implemented. Are implemented. It's going to be very difficult for civil society or um, our elected officials to track this. So it's going to, I think it would lead to a very undemocratic process. And then the, um, it's also important to address how TTIP might affect uh, neonic bans in U.S. cities. Now, I think we've heard that there's a couple of cities in Oregon and Spokane and Washington and Seattle and Washington that are putting bans and, and Minneapolis uh, working on it. So I think we need to consider how TTIP would, would affect those city bans or how bans at local levels could be affected by TTIP. Now, and then the last thing I'd like to mention is I think we, we should also think about how the investor state disputes settlement in its current form, of course. We, there's a lot of rumors on whether this would be taken out of the agreement or not and how this would also exacerbate these problems um, on, on how states legislate or how we legislate in the United States because if there's a risk of lawsuits, I think you know, they'll, they'll be a little bit less likely to put in legislation. So I, so I think we also need to consider how that could exacerbate all this. So I think the, the, I'm going to say thank you now for, for listening to me. And I think, you know, right now we're kind of exploring some of the issues on neonicotinoids and how TTIP will affect that. 
and I think we need to take a, a lot closer look and we need to think about how we can keep working on this and, and uh, keep, keep the pressure up because, you know, these are things that are really important for both public health and the environment and something like bee colony collapse is something that we can't ignore. So, so I would encourage people to get a hold of us at ARC or IATP or PAN um, and, and we'll let you know how we, how, how we can work on this together. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> I have a few questions here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, one that's sort of an informational clarification question, uh, perhaps for Jennifer, which is, what is the persistence of neonicotinoids in beeswax? Um, so, so far what we know is it for sure is lasting like a couple of seasons or a year. Um, they're, fi they're definitely finding um, pesticides in, neonic in the beeswax, including neonics, but not only neonics. Um, there's also pyrethroids and fungicides, and researchers are really starting to raise concern about the interactions of all these pesticides um, in beeswax. They're also finding it in the pollen and nectar back in the beehive, um, and they're finding it over several seasons. Well, next, um, I have a question, and I would open this <coughs> excuse me, to the various speakers. Why do you think the U.S. is so far behind Europe with uh, pollinator conservation and regulation of chemicals? Jennifer, do you want to start with that, and then maybe Martin or Jim make some comments? Okay. Um, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, the, the simple answer is that the, the, you know, we have, I think we have very strong authorities to regulate pesticides in this country, um, in the U.S., and I think that the pesticide office sees itself as providing tools to farmers, um, and those two, the, one of the essential or critical tools that they provide is pesticides. Um, so they're not oriented or geared towards um, the idea that, how do you have the most productive farming you can using the least toxic chemicals? Um, that's not what they do. Um, they just focus on productive farming without actually poisoning or killing things or people. Um, so, so the bar is, if you use it according to the label, is it safe? And the problem with neonics is you can use it according to the label, but because it's systemic and getting into the plant and poisoning for a long time and lasting in the environment, it's never safe. Um, yeah, from my side of the ocean, I would say, uh, from what I read, is that one thing is that for many years, um, European NGOs have been fighting conflicts of interest um, in the European uh, Food Safety Authority, uh, and I've seen uh, quite, I've read quite some scandals about uh, Problems of conflicts of interest in the Euro, in the EPA, US EPA. Uh, so I think this is uh, also maybe a driver of um, of this issue. Uh, another thing is that um, the authorization of, of pesticides in the European Union has nothing to do with productivity uh, and money. It's it has to do with uh, being safe and protecting. Um, basically human health. The environment is not so, so important, unfortunately, uh, except now for with Munich, but uh, most of the decisions are based on human health concerns. Um, and I think that, yeah, the, 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 the precautionary principle uh, is more, much more used uh, in the European Union, even though we would like it so, to be more used, but uh, this might be also a big difference. I think that last point is really important because I think it's similar here where, you know, they were introduced, I think, seen as, as a better alternative, as Jennifer pointed out, to some of the more human, dangerous, uh, you know, insects for human use or for human contact. And I think the fact that that is the focus. And then secondly, I think the second part, which is what we've been getting at is, you know, uh, pesticides aren't um, assessed on efficacy. In, by the by our agencies. They don't have to prove efficacy first. So I think the idea that we put something out there um, that was less harmful to the humans, uh, easier to put on, um, you know, less in the environment was the thought, and then, but did not, you know, pr 
prove that it actually had value at the end of the day for the crop production in most circumstances, I think, was the problem in the U.S., but I think that's also why we've been much slower because of that direct relationship between both the seed and the pesticide companies, in many cases being the same ones, and then how do we get at, um, and then the question of actual efficacy and, and real impact has been harder to, to make very clear. But I think we're, we're making progress. Um, I have a couple of questions that perhaps Martin can answer about um, some clarification of some of what you talked about. One is to define uh, what derogation means, um, but then also at what stage is the Byers Syngenta uh, court case and when is the outcome due? Um, okay, derogation means you, so member states uh, when there is an emergency, an outbreak of a specific pest, uh, member states are authorized uh, exceptionally, uh, normally just for one year, to <laughs> authorize or, during 120 days a uh, pesticide that is not authorized in the European Union, either, either because it has been banned due to its toxicity uh, or because it was never authorized because uh, the, 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 the buyer or Singenta or whoever never applied for an authorization. In theory, this derogation must not uh, happen every year. Uh, normally, it's a one-shot derogation, and then member states have to make it, take st structural measures uh, in order not to need any further derogations. But actually, some member states use derogations for years and years, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, the European Commission does not react on that. And the second question, what, what stage is the Bayer and Syngenta court case? Uh, it's really at the beginning, and it takes uh, normally two years to have a verdict from the court, and then if there's an appeal from one of the parties, another two years. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions, I think, for Robert, although I would open this uh, to other people as well, uh, to say a little bit more about TTIP. What is it? Who are the players? And could these, uh, could the provisions in TTIP affect the local level rules that we've been hearing about? Robert, are you there? I'm sorry, I just had to unmute my microphone and it wasn't working. Yeah, I mean, this is all, uh, I, I think, some good questions. And, and um, so TTIP is really a, a, a free trade agreement between the United States and, and, and the EU. So it's a free trade agreement. And because there aren't that many um, tariff-related barriers. Most of the emphasis is on reducing uh, non-tariff non barriers to trade and, and uh, sanitary and phytosanitary barriers to trade. So, and what this really means is they're trying to work out a way of, of you know, making, uh, I, I guess, kind of ironing out the differences between the regulations. Now, in, in terms of and you know the, the the main players is we have negotiators on uh, both sides of the Atlantic, and it's a very non-transparent process, and there's very few people that actually have access to this whole decision making. And I would also say that I think it's pretty commonly known that the industry has uh, more access to the negotiators than does civil society. So that gives us a potential problem. Now, in, in terms of what, what, how, how this can affect what happens at local level, and I think, Karen, you might actually be better at answering this, but I, the, what happens is <coughs> uh, trade rules and trade agreements, they're kind of the highest level of agreement. So if there's any sort of local level, state level, or even in general terms, national level, um, um, regulation that goes against the trade agreement, then this can be brought forth to a court of law or, you know, in, in this case, possibly even an in in investor state dispute uh, court, which is uh, kind of a private arbitration. So, and Karen, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think we had a related question is if whether the resolutions that we've heard discussed uh, could be affected by TTIP. 
And I guess I would let others correct me. I don't think a resolution per se um, would be affected by TTIP because, of course, the resolution is, doesn't actually change uh, anything in a legal sense. But one of our concerns about what we've heard about the whole process of regulatory cooperation, uh, the structure of the Regulatory Cooperation Council, is it establishes these different layers so that any time there is an idea for a proposal in a state legislature, in, at the federal level, at the member state level, uh, at any level of government, they, they need to notify this Regulatory Cooperation Council and start this whole very long process of cost-benefit analysis, comments, and, and answers. And um, our experience in the United States is that while, of course, you want transparency in this process, the way it's functioning in the United States at this point, it very much slows down new initiatives, um, almost to a standstill in some cases. And so that's our concern with TTIP, that if we get, we would get that kind of system kind of locked in on both sides. Um, I want to move on. We have a couple of questions that I think are, are kind of nice to move into now about what we can do, uh, which I think is a really great question. And in fact, part of our idea with this webinar was to get a better understanding of some of the issues and think through what we might do next. Um, as I said, we'll be sending around a recording of the webinar with all the slides um, to everyone who's registered. But we also have a listserv of people trying to take action on TTIP food and agriculture. Uh, so let me know if you're interested in participating in those discussions. Uh, my email address is khk at iatp.org. Uh, but the questions we have, one is, um, is there, that I think uh, perhaps, well, several people could answer, on the specific issue of neonics, uh, is there a network or campaign against neonics? Who, where, how can we link into this? And also, uh, how can community organizers use this information effectively? So I think first, specifically on the issue of neonics and what's happening. I would imagine Pesticide Action Network is pretty involved in that. Yeah, um, well, we are not working much with the U.S., so I will speak about the European Union situation. Um, it has basically been uh, mostly the beekeepers who have fought Neonix in the beginning. Um, Pan-Europe started working on that in 2008, I think. Um, and uh, in the last years, many, many NGOs joined um, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace. Um, so we made a coalition uh, uh, two years ago, and we are sharing information and making joint actions, joint letters, and so on. Um, and our members are also very much involved at uh, national level. Um, so we try to, to maintain the topic uh, a hot topic so that people don't forget about bees and neonics as we know that uh, the review of the ban in 2015 uh, will be a, a big fight. Um, yeah, so basically that, that's it. Um, and, but uh, yeah, I, I would say that one of the most important things uh, most useful thing that permitted to, to obtain the ban was uh, uh, media coverage, the use of media and communicating on the importance of pollinators for our um, food uh, supply and the biodiversity and so on. It's, it's, it was really the key. Um, and here in the U.S. there is a coalition as well and it's some of those same groups, um, Friends of the Earth, Pan U.S., Beyond Pesticides, my, my organization NRDC, Xerxes, society um, and also a number of local activists that are, have been getting bans in their own um, communities are involved. Um, the, I showed in my presentation some reports that those different groups have, have come out with and that coalition of groups is also um, reacting to the White House memorandum and um, working to get different agencies to take different steps as well as pushing some of the bills in Congress. So. Uh, it's a it's a very active group, and plugging into any one of those groups um, will get you to the coalition. 
So, Jim, do you know of anything going on in the Midwest? Uh, and not beyond what's been talked about with you know some of the work, I mean the Minnesota stuff, but I think it's more a question to me of um, a shift of, of the market as well. I mean, what I'm seeing is exactly the stuff that I mentioned about farmers having a much stronger interest in knowing about the impact in the unicotoids and looking for options. So I think what we're seeing is, is an, you know, an increasing move from, from the market itself and the farmers who are the customers to say, if this doesn't have value to us, why would we be um, having it out there? So I know it's not quite exactly the question, but I think that is a push that we're starting to see in agriculture. And I have a, a one of the comments that's come in. Uh, in Minnesota, there's a network that includes Pesticide Action Network North America and the Healthy Bees, Healthy Lives campaign. Uh, and people can contact Erin at thebeesneesdelivery.com for more information. Um, well, and, yeah. and I'll say Lex Horn, too, who's with Pesticide Action Network, is, is really involved with the coordination here in Minnesota and is doing great work with um, on both the policy plan and on the ground work. So I think there's a lot of action happening um, on neonics uh, within the U.S. and in the EU. I think this, it's really helpful for us to understand what's happening on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, as regards TTIP, um, there are some pretty active coalitions uh, in the U.S. We're a member of Citizens Trade Campaign, which includes labor, environment, family farm organizations. Um, in Europe, there's a similar coordination, the Seattle to Brussels network, of which ARC 2020 is a member, and I believe uh, Pan Europe is also a member of ARC 2020. So there is a lot of uh, collaboration happening. As I said, this connection between TTIP and neonicotinoids is something we're just starting to think through. I think, in any case, it's helpful for us to be learning from each other. Um, but we are trying to think through, you know, what if anything we need to be raising um, in the talks um, as we move forward. So I, I did get one question, uh, well, two questions. One information all about will the recording be made public? And we will be posting it to IETP's website and to the ARC 2020 website. Uh, so, it's just, so it will be easily available as well as we'll be sending around uh, recordings directly, a link to, to all of the people who registered for the webinar. Um, there was a question I can't answer yet um, about if these same issues apply with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and that is a good question. And when we send out, I will see if I can find out something about that. I know in the United States, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is really, uh, campaign on that is very active. And in fact, next week, there is a week of action in the United States on the TPP and Fast Track, our legislative mechanism to speed through approval of, of these trade agreements. Um, let's see, do any of the speakers have any last comments they'd like to make? Yeah, Karen, um, this is Robert. Uh, my, my last comment, I, I think you know, it's this huge value in, in working together on this and raising the public awareness. Now, um, in Europe, our, what we try to do is we try to unite a broad, a broad group of coalitions. Just to give an example, uh, Pan-Europe is, has, is a member of ARC and have been since its inception. And, and it gives us the ability to work on, you know, I think, complex issues like this, but then to put it more into the public. And we've done a lot of work on endocrine disruptors. So I, so I think there's you know, big value. And what we're trying to do today is kind of take the first steps on how we can work together both on, across the Atlantic but also in our different regions, because this is something really important. Anyone else? All right. Well, we're right at time. I really want to thank the speakers. I think I've really learned a lot from this. And as I said, um, be in touch if you would like to work with us to, to help make these connections. Um, you can either write to me at khk at itp.org or uh, when we send around the recording, you could uh, there will be contact information there as well for the different speakers. So thanks to all the speakers and to our audience. and. Uh, the webinar is now completed.